Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, and thank you, um, Maria, for starting that recording. Um, these recordings will become available on our website post session. Uh, we are very excited to have all of you join us for the ninth um, Dental Education Network for Texas, um, abbreviated DET ECHO. Uh, we have wonderful didactic and case presentations lined up for you today. Uh, my name is Kato, and I will assist in facilitating today's session. Um, for those who may be new to ECHO, this is a model that builds virtual communities of practice and learning. Um, sessions begin with a didactic presentation followed by a de-identified de case-based learning and group discussion to foster deep knowledge and build individual capacity. Before we carry on, I will ask Maria, our UT ECHO IT, to share some guidance about your audio connection. Thank you, Kato. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to remind everyone to please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can mute it or unmute yourself um, using the bottom left icon on your screen. If you have dialed in, please use star six on your phone um, to mute and unmute as well. Please feel free to also communicate with me using the chat function. Um, I'd like to also remind everyone that no personal health information is allowed when discussing cases and scenarios for today. Thank you and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Maria. Um, and let's move on to introductions. Um, when I um, call you, um, please um, let, let us know who you are and where you're calling in from. Um, Dr. Aguilar? Hi, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today. We're so glad to have everyone here. I'm Dr. Rosalie Aguilar with the Dent Echo Hub, and welcome. Thank you. Um, and today's didactic presenter, Dr. Cohen. Hi, I'm Dr. Howard Cowan. I'm from the University of Iowa College of Dentistry. Uh, I direct the Geriatric and Special Needs Program here, as well as the uh, Geriatric uh, Graduate Certificate Program, which we started about 10 years ago, of which Dr. Kundapur is a graduate and will be giving the uh, case presentation after I complete my didactic aspect. Great. Thank you, Vinay. And Dr. Kundapur. Hi, I'm Dr. Vinay Kundapur, and I completed my BDS and MDS from India. I'm specialized in prosthodontics. Then later, I completed my fellowship in geriatrics and special needs under mentorship of Dr. Howard Cowan. And presently, I'm working at uh, UT Health as a part time employment in HOPE program as a program dentist. Uh, HOPE is holistic oral health program for elderly. And I'm also complete doing my MS program presently at uh, biomedical school at UT Health. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before we move on to didactics, um, by Dr. Cohen, um, I have a few announcements. Um, to everyone who's joined this session, um, please enter your name, title, and affiliation into the chat to help us with attendance and so that we can get to know each other through chat. Um, if you haven't already completed the pre-session questionnaire, um, you can do this now using the link in the chat box. Um, if you selected that you would like to receive continuing education credit in your registration, we will follow up by email with instructions for completing the post-session evaluation and attaining your credits. Um, ECHO is an all-teach, all-learn supportive model, and ECHOs thrive on the interaction from the full learning network. So we encourage all to participate in the conversation today. We also encourage you to join by video if you can, so that we can see your faces, um, especially during discussion portion of the session. Our session today will include a didactic presentation from Dr. Cohen on partial caries removal, the science and practice, and a case presentation from Dr. Kumapur. As a reminder, you can use the chat to raise questions and comments at any point during the session. Um, Dr. Cohen, when you're ready, um, please okay. sure. take it away. Okay, does that look like the screen is showing correctly? Yep. Okay, so um, today we are going to take talk about partial caries removal. I am going to um, go rather quickly. So I'm gonna start talking, once I start talking, I'm gonna start flying through this. 
half an hour is really not enough time to talk about this. So I'm going to cover a lot of material. Uh, if you have questions afterwards, you can email me or we can, uh, you know, get to some, hopefully some time for some questions afterwards. But today I'm going to review the evidence for partial or incomplete carries removal. Okay. I am going to explain the materials and conditions for a positive outcome for this approach. And I'm going to present some uh, clinical examples. And then Dr. Kundapur will give a case that we worked on together when she was a student here. So the science of dentistry is constantly changing. Uh, that's a um, something that we have to think about because we like to get caught in our little uh, webs and our little confined areas and we kind of forget about what else is going on out there. But it's important to think about this. This is a significant change in the thought process of how we do our day-to-day -day activities in dentistry. Critical thinking and everyday day-to-day -day restorative um, dentistry is essential for person-centered contact. And so we need to maintain that at all at all times. Um, that's good. Um, so every person in every situation has its own unique characteristics. I don't like to think of any time that I can say in general, I do this, which maybe is so, but every time I see a patient there, they're each individual. And if that particular circumstance is gonna lead me to make a critical decision and uh, what I think is best for that particular person. In terms of partial caries removal, we're gonna talk about this. Is this an effective strategy for restorative care? It's really hard to wrap our heads around this. This is one of those things, I think it's almost like the, the new telescope that's out there and, and telling us what, what's been in the place and how we're seeing galaxies and, and all these things from billions of years ago. And it's just, it's hard to, not quite that bad, but it is hard to think about leaving caries in a tooth and thinking that that's gonna be an effective approach and a long-term for a tooth. And uh, it took me a while to get used to doing this, but uh, is there evidence to support it? And from a clinical perspective, as well as a, um, um, from, uh, to me, mostly a clinical perspective is what's important. So is there then a difference in how we look at people? Okay, And it depends on what your goals are. Um, I guess is what it really boils down to. When I look at these two people, um, I see the uh, child on the right and what's the same and how would I look at the dentition of the child on the right compared to the elderly lady on the left? Well, they both have a transitional dentition. So what would be my goal in restoring a tooth? My goal is gonna be maybe I'm not talking about a middle-aged person and in which I think that if I'm gonna put a composite restoration, I have an expectation that it might last 10 years or 12 years or 14 years. Uh, if I have an elderly lady who's 95 years old, I have a child who's 10 or 11, I know the transition in that time period is going to be a little bit different, and I might need a restoration to only last five years, six years, seven years. And the goals of what I'm doing might be different than if I'm treating a 35 or 40-year-old normal adult um, person. So again, your goals are different. Every time you see a person it has a unique situation. In case of the elderly, and I'm going to I'm going to wrap this uh, into a lot of the elderly because partial caries removal was initially um, that technique was originally thought of and started being used in the pediatric population specifically because of the um, uh, nature of the deciduous teeth, which is very transient, and knowing that the tooth is going to be exfoliated in a short period of time, you can make a better decision and understand that. In an elderly population, you have to it might not be exact. Uh, as, a, as a deciduous dentition, but we have a shorter period of time for some of these teeth and we can med, then make decisions specifically for that person. Um, but we do have teeth now that uh, in the elderly that are, that are being maintained for a longer period of time. And we always think this is a really good thing. And in most people, if they are ambulatory and they're in good health and they're functional, it is a good thing. But sometimes that's not the case. Uh, Alzheimer's disease being a uh, disease that affects a lot of uh, elderly people, I'm not going to get into the statistics of it, um, has, has shortcomings and sometimes can, can uh, as the disease progresses, can cause lots of problems with oral care. Someone who's kept their teeth their whole life, in this case, we saw this, uh, this lady in a nursing home when she was actually 75 years old to begin with, and she was a very aggressive Alzheimer's patient, wouldn't let us get into her mouth. By the time she was 90 and advanced, she was much more docile. A son brought her in to see us. And we know that from that, from specifically now, this patient hadn't been seen in nearly 15 years. And this is the result. So she had a good dentition her whole life, had been to a dentist, 
and you can see the gingivitis, the calculus, and the resultant um, problems that ensue when someone hasn't had care for the mouth all for a long period of time. So the periodontal disease, the caries, various things that you're going to have to deal with uh, with the elderly patient. So when we talk about these people, and we're trying to make decisions, we have to think, okay, what is the risk of no treatment? And we can look at that because say there's obviously, not obviously, but in most people, there might be some pain, it's certainly going to have some infection. When in the elderly, we're going to have systemic disease complications, and we now know the association between oral disease and systemic disease is going to affect blood sugar control. It might have an increased risk of cardiac complications and stroke, increased risk of aspiration pneumonia for sure with, with anybody that has dysphagia, um, and increased risk then of earlier death. So clinical restorative decision-making in geriatric dentistry, in, in to my mind, any restorative dentistry becomes extremely important. In my practice, when I say I'm going to do a restorative procedure, my assistants know that they're going to have to get everything out. They're going to have, I mean, if I'm going to do an anterior tooth, they're not going to get an alloy out. But in, in lots of different cases, I've had lots of, uh, in any other tooth, I've got lots of decisions to make, but I'm going to use a glass armor. I could use a composite. I could use multiple restorative, multiple um, um, types of materials in one tooth. And so everything is on the table. Um, not necessarily what is on the treatment plan. So as I'm looking in the mouth, I'm going to make a different assessments and based on different things. Quickly, I'm going to look at pulpal changes in uh, the elderly because we might not have a pulp. So I'm going to make decisions based on something there where I can maybe put pins in a tooth that I might not be able to do on other people. I'm going to look at xerostomia in someone's mouth, which is going to be, we know in general, xerostomia is going to cause increased risk of caries. Um, and it might be caused by medications or systemic diseases, whatever they might have, but also has problems with prosthesis you might be making. And in the end, it also might make a difference as to what restorative material you're going to be using because restorative materials, especially GIs, are not going to last as long in a uh, mouth that's very dry because it needs to have Susie. hydration. So as well as doing that and looking in the mouth, I'm gonna look at a comprehensive approach to each patient. I'm gonna look at their social background, their mental health, their dental health as well as, I, as I'm looking in their mouth, but also I need to look at their medical history and their functional capacity to make sure I'm gonna make a good decision as to how that outcome is gonna be determined. So how do you decide the best possible treatment options for these kinds of patients? And if I look at a patient like this and I'm just looking in the mouth, I'm looking at a disaster and it could be something that might very well, uh, after radiographs, to look and say, you know, is this e dentition even salvageable? And maybe a complete upper, complete lower denture is the way you're going to go. But now, if I look at the patient, and the patient turns out to be a late stage Alzheimer's patient with significant complications and maybe end of life care, I might make a different decision. Is there any pain associated with these teeth? Possibility for infection? How am I going to treat this person? What's the outcome? What can the patient tolerate? Uh, lots of things are going to have to go into my uh, mindset is to make to make a good decision for this patient. But if the patient is a 65 or 75 year old who has for some reason decided or didn't maintain their dentition for a while for whatever reasons and lots of things happen, it could be a medical reason, could be a stroke, could be a loss of a, of a spouse. In any case, they come back in and now they've made a decision to uh, approach oral care again and you might make a totally different decision. So those are two opposite extremes, but Looking in the mouth is only part of good decision making when you're looking at how to care for patients. So factors when deciding appropriate treatment, especially in the geriatric patient, all these can be any patients. You have the patient's desires and expectations to think about, the type and severity of their dental needs, how the patient's dental problems affect his or her quality of life, their ability to tolerate the stress of the treatment, the patient's ability to maintain the oral health. If they can't functionally maintain it, do they have good social support? The probability of probable of positive outcomes with the specific uh, treatment you might do. Yes. The patient's ability to maintain the oral health independently, the probability of uh, positive outcomes, the availability of reasonable and less expensive treatment alternatives, the patient's financial status, their ability to deliver, your ability to deliver the care needed. Can you even uh, provide that care depending on the approach that you're going to be making? and other issues associated with the patient at the end of life, what's the lifespan, et cetera. So what I'm trying to get at is instead of just looking in the mouth, we really have to look at the whole big picture to make a good critical decision as to what 
the best care for their patients are. Patients are going to come in with complex medical histories, uh, and that might affect whether it's a medical problem, a functional problem. They're going to have complex pharmacological histories, which lots of uh, side effects of those uh, uh, pharmacological agents that they're taking. They're going to have a functional potential problem that, from easy thing like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, could be a post-stroke victim, just general frailty. What are the things that you're going to have to think about when you make decisions for that particular patient? So. If we think about this in a little bit more simplistic term, we could look at the challenge that you have in treating your patients. And I can, uh, this is one sentence, but it is one heck of a sentence. Our challenge then as a, as a dental professional is to listen to what a person wishes for himself, evaluate the oral status, the dental, medical, functional, pharmaceutical, social, psychological, constellation of all those impacts together, explore realistic probabilities, advise the person as to the short-term and long-term prognosis, guide that person through those options, and then generate a seamless plan of oral health care for that person. Simple, one, uh, one sentence, but very difficult to do in many situations. So in terms of the geriatric patient, uh, we're looking at generally a new approach. When I started uh, doing uh, this type of dentistry 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we had a lot of denture patients. Now with the edentulist rate going down to about 15% or even lower, especially in our nursing home patients as well, we don't have that many. Uh, now we have a lot of teeth to deal with. So the new geriatric patient is older, they have more systemic diseases, they have more medications, they have more intellectual, intellectual disabilities, they have more functional disabilities, and they have more teeth. And so ultimately, we have a much more difficult situation uh, to deal with and seemingly how are we gonna be able to uh, appropriately care for these patients so that they, don't, uh, they can continue to function for some time uh, prior to passing. So traditional caries management has changed dramatically. It used to be pretty simple. We had a tooth, you, you had plaque on your teeth, you ate food, you ate sugar, and that was the end of that, you had caries. Now we know there's much more to it than that. Again, approach to thinking about caries from a perspective that takes you out of that simple mindset. And now you have various things that go into how you're gonna make a decision. You know, we do have now, we have genetics. Is genetics a part of caries? Yeah, we know that that is. It's definitely a part of caries. It's very part of periodontal disease. That has to go into our thought process. We know that different people have different bacteria and we can look at that part of it. We know that the pH and the biofilm has an effect on the caries. All those things need to be taken into consideration. So we're gonna get into the specifics now about how the science of this has come about. So in 2016, an international caries consensus collaboration was formed, managing caries lesions, consensus recommendation terminology. This is 2016, so again, this is not this is a relatively new concept, and some people it's still a very difficult concept to understand. But again, look at what this is. 21 cariology experts from 12 different countries, and they came to a consensus, which is pretty amazing. Complete caries removal is no longer recommended. That's a pretty strong statement. Quote, removal of carious lesion to leave only hard debt throughout the cavity is considered overtreatment. Now, I'm sure every one of you, if they have a license to practice dentistry, took your uh, clinical boards and that was not part of what your clinical boards taught you. Uh, I'm sure they taught you to take out everything that you could and that's generally the way most things are done these days and still, but they should be thought of differently and that's what I'm trying to approach you with today. Incomplete excavation, now named various, if various um, terminology, selective removal to soft dentin, selective removal to leathery dentin, but in either case, the peripheral enamel, and we'll talk about this as well in a little bit later, is the peripheral enamel and dentin should be hard. So consensus recommendation, selective removal to firm dentin is the treatment of choice for both dentitions, deciduous and permanent, and shallow or moderately deep cavitated dental lesions radiographically, even though it's only again, a two-dimensional uh, picture, less than one third of the way to the pulp. So if you see caries, which in a lot of people might be even considered incipient caries, but definitely through the DEJ, less than one third of the way to the pulp, it's every indication that you should remove all the caries. But if caries looks radiographically, at least two thirds of the way to the right pulp, then you should be thinking about selective removal to soft dentin, which is recommended in these deep carious lesions. 
terminology, minimally invasive dentistry. We want to make sure this is different than atraumatic restorative treatment, which sometimes has a, has a different, that's a definitely a different terminology. So minimally intervention dentistry is the uh, holistic caries management philosophy that integrates caries lesion control and minimal operative intervention. The main objective is to, to preserve tissue, include early caries detection and non-operative treatment if possible combined with minimally invasive restorative procedures. ART, on the other hand, is a traumatic restorative treatment and it's the tissue saving caries management approach that uses hand inserts for opening caries cavities and removing decomposed caries dentin followed by restoration with the high viscosity glass ionomer. Again, this is not a technique I'm, I'm necessarily recommending. I'm recommending minimally invasive dentistry, although art, it does have its place in certain circumstances. Complete caries removal, the hard dentin uh, is uh, excavation to hard uh, tissue. Partial caries removal is excavation by which caries dentin is removed from the peripheral walls of a deep cavitated lesion, uh, followed by partial removal to soft dentin from the pulpal wall. So in all cases, partial caries removal does require excavation of caries dentin to be removed on the peripheral walls to hard tissue. So we're not gonna leave soft tissue on the periphery of any preparation that we do at any time. Selective caries removal to soft dentin is an alternative term for partial caries removal. Selective caries removal to leathery dentin is a removal of uh, uh, to firm or leathery dentin is the excavation to uh, leathery dentin in the pulpal aspect of the cavity. Periphery of the cavity should again should be excavated to hard dentin. Uh, and stepwise caries removal, some of you have heard of this, is essentially removing of caries in a two-step procedure in which you go, uh, place the restoration, go back later and replace the restoration. I'm not advocating for stepwise caries removal and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, Cochrane system review of operative uh, caries management in 2018 showed the stepwise caries removal resulted in a 56% reduction in incidence of pulp exposure compared to complete caries removal. That's a pretty good indication as to why we might decide that this is a treatment of choice uh, in many patients, especially low income patients, as well as some of the elderly patients, a decision will be made. If you're going to uh, have insult to the pulp and a root canal is needed, the, the, the answer is take the tooth out now so we can extend the life of a tooth uh, by doing this technique. Partial caries removal resulted in a 77% reduction in incidence of pulp exposure compared to complete caries removal. So the conclusion, these techniques show clinical advantage over complete caries removal in the management of clinical caries. So alternative restored options for patients with high-risk caries, geriatric patients, pediatric patients, and adult special needs patients. So again, taking into consideration all the challenges and the modifying factors, which can be many, erosion, abra abrasion, demineralization, rampant caries, sound and retained root tips, uh, subgingival caries, recurrent caries, dry oral environments, poor access to care, patient disruptive behaviors, poor compliance with preventive care, high plaque levels, financial and other considerations, all these factors taking into place might prevent you from doing what you consider standard of care with your normal um, restorative uh, techniques. So how did this all come about? And so when I was going to dental school, we had composites and we had amalgams. So if you were to tell me that I could relieve caries in a tooth, uh, I would say that's pretty crazy unless theoretically we have a carious process which is anaerobic uh, is, is caries is, is something that's done by aerobic bacteria. So if you confine aerobic bacteria into an anaerobic environment, you will at least stop the activity of the aerobic uh, bacteria. So if you had a perfect seal every time, it would make sense that you could seal those bacteria into a tooth and not have any progression of caries. But our seals obviously are not perfect. And so we do have in, uh, oxygenation going through and some broken seals, and that would make caries, leaving caries in a tooth, um, possibly not very effective. So what kind of materials do we have now? And materials are still evolving. We have a group of materials now called bioactive restorative materials, as opposed to non-bioactive. Non-bioactive materials in our general uh, armamentarium are amalgams and composites. 
bioactive materials are glass ionomers. When I say glass ionomers, we have three different levels. We have a glass ionomer sealant, we have a glass ionomer cement, and we have a glass ionomer resin modified glass ionomer. We also then have um, um, geomers or uh, copamers, which some of you might use either known as uh, uh, by, uh, beautiful or activa uh, is also another one. Uh, and, then the, and new things are on the horizon as well. And how do these things come out now? And I'll talk a little bit about the, how the, the uh, evolution of glass ionomers has actually come about as well. So fluoride releasing restorative materials. Again, we have GI sealant. Uh, I use most of the GC products. I don't, I don't care what you use. You can use any of these. Reva products are okay. We just happen to use the GC products here at the University of Iowa. Um, it is important to understand the difference. When we say, when we use the word glass ionomer, that there are three different uh, classifications of glass ionomer, the sealant, the cement, and the resin modified. Compromers are also sometimes thought about as fluoride releasing. Again, you might use beautiful, activa, freedom, some of these, but the fluoride release in these is minimal. So we have restorative options. You have amalgams, you have the composites, you have a compromer. You have a resin modified glass ionomer, and then you have a glass ionomer cement, and you have a glass ionomer sealant. So what does that mean? So characteristics of these materials are important. The aesthetics um, are, are the best with a composite, and the aesthetics decrease significantly as you go down to a glass ionomer sealant. But on the other hand, the fluoride release is the highest in the glass ionomer sealant, and the aesthetics, that, uh, as you go up, the composites and the amalgams have no fluoride release. So from that perspective, we get different levels of, uh, as we think about things and why we're using things. So major advantages then of glass ionomers. Major advantages is a chemical adhesion instead of bonded adhesion. Why is that important? It's a stronger bond to dentin and it's a stronger bond to cementum. So thinking about that root structure, if you're gonna be using one of these materials on a root structure, on a cementum, uh, you should think strongly about using either uh, one of those materials, a glass uh, resin, maybe a resin modified glass ionomer. Chemical adhesion then has also a closer adaptation to the underlying tissue. It's a closer adaptation to dentin and cementum and that whether the dentin is unaffected, affected or infected, it has a closer adaptation and it has the ability to remineralize the affected and infected dentin due to high fluoride release. So putting these materials on affected dentin can is, is effectively harden that material. The two-step uh, bond, the two-step method, um, stepwise method of going back in was found initially decided upon. And as they kept on going back into the stepwise, they found that when they went back in, the material was hardened. And so that's why partial carriage removal turned into more of a permanent procedure instead of a transitional uh, two-step procedure. So there's easy placement of these materials is also a major advantage. First of all, we could, we'll talk a little bit about the sealants. The sealants have the highest fluoride release, about six times more than the glass ionomer cements. Again, it has a chemical bonding, so there's no etching. Uh, highest likelihood of remineralization. Fluoride release up to 24 months. Um, and command, it can be either self-cure or command cure. Again, realizing, again, fluoride release for up to 24 months after placement. So, uh, Indications for use of the glass ion or sealant are actually sealants, and that's what it was actually designed for, actually to be a sealant. So it can also be used for hypersensitivity as a temporary endo seal, which our, our endo department likes to use it for, as an intermediate restorative material for rampant carries. It can also be used that way, and you can get white as well as pink. You don't have to use pink. So it's a good material if you're doing rampant carries removal and you want to come back in afterwards because because you're going to have the best chance of remineralization with this material. So it can also be used then in partial and incomplete carries uh, removal. You have resin modified glass ionomers, RMGIs. These are light cured, chemical adhesion as well, okay, better aesthetics. These are generally used for class three and class five restorations um, and for cervical erosion and abstraction lesions, again, because that is a better bond than the composite is. It's a stronger bond to the cementum. It's generally used for root carries, and many people use this as a liner or a base. Uh, some people use Vitrobond, which is a RMGI as a liner or base. 
uh, and that causes decreased sensitivity if you're going to put a composite or an alloy on top of that. So evolution of glass ionomers. If some of you have been used glass ionomers in the past and you, just, and you thought they were really bad, that's because you probably used something called Fuji 9, uh, Fuji Extra. Some of these materials, the original of glass ionomer cements developed in the 1970s, they were here for a long time. The handling was extremely difficult and due, due to the bad handling, many people did not like to use them. 2014, a new material was was presented to our profession, Equia Forte Fill, through, um, which is a glass hybrid, glass particles within the conventional glass ionomer. There were more fluoride released in this material. And then 2019, Equia Forte HT was released, which again, glass hybrid, even more mechanical properties, more fluoride release, improved translucency, better aesthetics. And also then came with a resin coat, which both of these came as with as well. Okay, so we have traditional reinforced GI, GICs, which have been used in the past, um, which has less moisture sensitivity, and uh, it's a stronger material. So less moisture sensitivity is important, but that's not moisture from saliva, it's moisture sensitivity from what, you're, what the moisture that you put on the tooth. So you don't want to desiccate the tooth prior to putting the material on the tooth. Again, the really important part of this is, as well is that it can reabsorb fluoride and recharge the material recharges with the fluoride. If you're going to prescribe a uh, prescription fluoride or you're going to do a fluoride varnish, the uh, glass ion or cements will recharge and continue to release fluoride for a longer period of time again as well. So the improved glass ion or cement, Equia Forte Fill, um, is a, again, a glass hybrid restorative system. Chemical adhesion creates a hybridized layer. It's easy and quick to use, not very technique sensitive. It is not sticky. So if you haven't used this material before, it is one of those game changers and it makes this whole process something that if you haven't done before, you really need to think about doing. Um, no preliminization or shrinkage. So there's much, much, much less sensitivity. I can pretty much guarantee that no matter how close you get to the pulp, if you use a glass ion armor cement on the top of that uh, uh, for that restoration, directly onto the depth of the restoration, wherever it is, you're not gonna have any sensitivity with the tooth. Extremely rare. The coefficient of thermal extent, expansion is very similar to dentin, again, reducing the sensitivity. Optimal marginal seal that offers long-term resistance is, is there, especially in the dentin and the cementum. High fluoride release at tooth restorative interface with recharge capability is important. Outstanding resistance to wear and acid erosion and available in eight aesthetic shades. So now, again, the big advance with this material is that now you can use it for a class two restoration. Class animals were only designed to be in class five restorations previously, but now with this improved material, we can use this in a class two restoration. You can compact it and you can get a contact, which is pretty crazy. So we can now use it in pediatric restorations, geriatric special needs populations, and how long does this last? I've had these going, I put these in patient's mouth, class twos, and have them last five years without any problem. But again, it depends on the patient, it depends on the oral cavity, depends on how they're taking care of things, just like everything else. But it is potentially a fairly long lasting restoration. So you can also use a GC coat, which increases the, the life, lifespan of the restoration itself. That does prevent absorption of more fluoride at the later time. And I'm not gonna get into specifically with that, but you could put it on just certain parts of the restoration as well. So. 2019, the Forte HT is a more, has a more improved translucency, so we're getting a little bit better aesthetics again. We have particle size distribution again for better handling, optimal marginal seal, high fluoride release, even more than the uh, Equia Forte Phil original, and ideal restorative treatment for high risk caries patients and class two restorations. So again, improved handling, improved fluoride release, flexural strength is increased, especially with the coat, Compressive strength is increased and wear resistance is increased. So here you can see on the bottom chart, you see various uh, uh, um, different, different uh, materials, glass ionomer uh, cements that are used and they're compared to each other. And you can see the Forte Fill HT, the amount of fluoride release over time. 
So it starts at zero, it goes to 84 days. And again, the fluoride release continues even up to three months after placement. So this is just a quick example of how long it takes. It's about a three minute procedure um, after, be, after being light, if you wanna light cure the coat afterwards, but it's a pretty quick procedure. It sets up nice, it's compactable, great material. If you haven't used it, you really need to start using it. Uh, improved marginal seal with the smoothness. If you use the coat, which is the coat will wear off though. It's not meant to be it's an unfilled resin. Okay. Uh, there is, uh, it does prevent ion exchange and fluoride recharge uh, on top. Okay. So decisions, if you did a class two, for instance, I would put this on the occlusal aspect, but I wouldn't put it on the, on the proximal aspect because that's where I really want the uptake because that's the better chance for uh, recurrent caries as opposed to having that on the occlusal aspect. So glass ionomers transitional, are they transitional or is they permanent? And again, it depends on how long you want this to last. What's the intended lasting of the restoration? Uh, and what do you consider transitional or permanent? So where's the restoration being placed? Obviously, if it's a high uh, functional area, it's gonna be, it's gonna last less, not as long. Is it gonna be anterior, is it gonna be posterior? What surfaces are being used? What's the patient's oral environment, or environment? Are the high caries risk? Are they zero stomach? All those things would have to go into your decision as to whether or not uh, you think that that's where you're gonna put it and how long it might last. So general principles. You're gonna remove gross rampant that carries with a higher slow speed handpiece. You are not gonna confuse this with art and you're gonna either remove it, uh, which is just removing a fan instrumentation. And the whole point of this procedure is to not expose the pulp. So you have something big, the patient is not sensitive. They don't have a peripheral lucency. That's when you're gonna use it and you're purposely not gonna go in. And the reason you're doing this is to not expose the pulp. Its whole point is to avoid a root canal. Stepwise excavation is gonna be a transitional thing. So we're gonna, not gonna do stepwise because that means we're gonna expect to replace it later. Although you might, you might decide that this, you could use this technique in a 50 year old person and say, hey, I don't know if this is gonna be a root count or not. We're gonna try this. This is gonna be a great interim restoration. In that case, you would use it as an interim restoration and then go back in and change it to something and maybe crown the tooth or do something with it later. Incomplete or partial carries excavation. Again, no expectation to replace it and it's a final restoration. So again, principle, this is really important. Again, no carries to remain within two millimeters of the cable surface margin when you're using this technique. So what now has happened is you're using, uh, this is a base with glass ionomer sealant um, or, or a glass ionomer cement. And that is acting as a, uh, as a base and now you're not having a um, pulp, uh, you're not doing a, uh, uh, you're not gonna have a direct pulp cap anymore because we're going to use this material to whatever uh, carries is, is maintained, it's gonna be arrested and that's gonna cause a bridge and we're not gonna need to have a pulp cap and we're essentially, it's gonna act as a pulp cap. So this is what it might look like, incomplete excavation, large carries, you can see this, and this would look like, when I look at this clinically, you can say, well, this looks like an endo tooth, but we're not having any symptoms. There's no peripheral relucency. The test and the tooth is testing vital. And in the end, you're gonna leave that two millimeters because it's really important to have a good seal. If you don't have a good seal, I don't care how much fluoride you have in any material, you're not going to end up with a good restoration. So a good seal is, is the most important aspect of this. The advantages of, of a transitional restoration uh, patient confidence, motivation, self-esteem. It's cost-effective, minimal discomfort. One to two surface restorations are very effective. Larger restorations are, you have to think about why you're using them. Um, you might uh, gain field control for final restorations, low caries risk, uh, simplified treatment planning, and again, various other thought processes as you go through this. And if it's a permanent, you're gonna preserve, you, you have different reasons. Again, we talked about these. I'm gonna kind of zip through this as best we can to show you a couple examples. So if we look at a tooth like this, something that might look like we are gonna get to a pulp exposure. And if I was gonna remove caries, I'd say, yeah, that looks like a pulp exposure. And what am I gonna do to cover that? The various materials that you have, okay? So that I could do something over the top without getting a frank exposure. So if I took that uh, 
tooth in the top right and put a, even though it looks like it's close to exposure and I've got the periphery cleaned, if I put a glass animal on top of that, you are going to have no sensitivity. I'll say it again, there will be no sensitivity. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not. Uh, but uh, most of the time our patients don't like sensitivity and glass animals, again, are extremely uh, palliative to the teeth. So you can do it this way as a transitional stage. You got rampant caries. What are you gonna do with this? Again, rampant caries control, go in really quickly, replace it with relatively unesthetic glass animal or cements, and depending on the patient. Sometimes these patients will never come back. Sometimes they will. And if they do come back, fine. That's great. Then you can change it and have a great technique because you know what? This person cares about their mouth. We've done something for them and we can go to veneers or something more, something that's going to be more aesthetic later. Okay. So what about some of the other things we we're talking about? Here's a patient I had, uh, came in, had a three unit bridge and you can see carries in the distal, mesial and distal of the premolar of number um, 13 and carries mm -hmm. on the mesial of number 14. Number 14 has a root canal line. You can see the endo, okay? What material can I use there? Again, thinking about both these two different teeth, I have no symptoms on number 13 and he wants to save this bridge. Well, I know that I, I can see that, that faded line there. That's the, that's the gingival tissue. And I know both of these are gonna be very difficult to isolate. And I'm not, I, I'm trying to do the best I can here on this. So I decide I'm going to do an alloy on the, the molar, because I know I can get a good steel subgingially. I try to get a good uh, glass iron or cement on the distal of the, of the premolar, but you can see I have a void. He comes back the next year. I kind of felt something was wrong, took a radiograph of it, got a void. So, okay, and then this happens many times if you're too far subgingival. So we did a little laser treatment, went back in, got a better restoration in in 2015. So we now have a tooth that's five years later and we've maintained this guy's bridge. Here we have a lady comes in, she has some large restorations on, and she wants to build up, she wants some crowns. By the time we get done with the, with the restorations, there's nothing to build these teeth up. If some of you have used pins before, uh, you can do pin buildups. If I had a composite, you might think a composite is the best way of uh, uh, choice to use to build these up. But when you look at, if there's no enamel left to bond to, a composite is not gonna be nearly as good as a glass iron or cement or a resin modified glass iron or cement because they're gonna bond much better to the underlying tooth structure. And you can see again, uh, what, what you might get with a resin modified or, a, or a, a glass iron or cement prior to putting a crown on a tooth. Some of us see, I had this case, for some reason decided to make a decision. We get crazy just things that we do when we get uh, some of these patients. 2016, you can, I want you to look at the bridge going from number nine over to, in this case, number 11. Uh, and you can see the carries under number 11, through and through carries, uh, young kid. So we decided to try and save this tooth. So I sectioned the tooth over here, went under, I tried to uh, uh, limit, take the root tip out of number 11. So I bonded number 11 uh, to number 12. Then I went and surgically removed the root tip. And in the process, I surgically, did a bad thing and hit the distal or hit the mesial root of number 13. Well, I thought that's that wasn't a good thing. So now I might have to lose number 13. So I quickly tried to dry the environment and you can see, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I put a glass of cement on that root structure on the mesial. So here we are, 2016, 2019, we took a radiograph of it. And since then the bond came loose, but the tooth is still vital with that glass ionomer cement still stuck in that root structure that I had opened up and put in. So glass ionomer cements, like I said, are very palliative. This is something we see a lot of, uh, carries at the DEJ that's, that blow up after a while. And you can see getting into this is difficult, okay? Once a prep is done, you can see a slice of it's made and a, and a uh, prep down there and got the carries out. Now, how am I gonna fill it? Now you can see the final restoration with a contact and that's what a with the new glass ionomers can do. So contacts can be obtained very easily. Again, here's another one, number 29, uh, heavy carries, looks like it might need endo. 2016, we went in, removed the carries, very deep, got a contact, 2020 still, no symptoms. So these are the types of things you can do with glass ion or cements. Again, 
with class twos for a long period of time. But again, it all depends on the patient and various other things that, you know, that are uh, uh, those factors that we talked about that either are gonna make it long-term or short-term. Conclusion then, understand the evidence of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, understand your patient, all the modifying factors that are associated with that. Um, decide on the best approach and the most appropriate treatment for that patient. Okay, I know I went over, I'm sorry, Vinny, go take it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Sure. Um, yes, Dr. Kunapur, please take, uh, please share your slides and then. Um... And if you have any questions for Dr. Cohen, um, please um, put it into the chat. And... Thank you, Dr. Kevin. So with the present presentation, what we had already, it's very evident that we need to be very considerate and treating older adults is a very complex process. And we need to prioritize and balance between the systemic dental and their psychological factor when we have to consider giving them a longevity of a dental intervention or a dental restoration. So here is my patient who was 68 year old. She presented to the geriatrics and special needs clinic uh, and her initial examination was done in February, 2019. And she presented for the re-evaluation and prosthetic rehabilitation in September, 2019. Now, when we consider only the dental history, I'm sure it will be very surprising why that six months of lag over there. So that is very important here that whenever it comes to geriatric patients, we need to really consider the other five aspects that the social history, whether they are financially independent or dependent, whether they are functionally independent or dependent, and how is their mental status. And here, the patient who was coming to our clinic, she was nearly traveling around 100 miles. And luckily, she was accompanied by her daughter and that she could make the appointment. But in spite of that, there is one more important factor we need to consider. The financially, she was funded, but the medical history and the medications. I'm sure this slides looks very overwhelming. She really had a significant medical history. If you see here, uh, coming to her joints, like she had her knee replacement done in 2001, and then she had a fall. And uh, because of the frostbite, her, uh, she now has a prosthetic limb. Her limb was amputated. And then she had a very strong history of her cardiac, like there were five subsequent heart attack she had and she had some stent placed and that failed she went for a double bypass and later there was a valve replacement repair that was done in 2017 so these are some of the very significant medical history what we can see like some surgeries so i think now we can clearly see when she lost the balance in 2019 while she was removing the prosthetic limb she was seen in the er and that shows a lag why after february 2019 she did not present herself to go ahead or proceed with her dental treatment so in spite of having the significant medical history she turned up and then we proceeded with her treatment but this is very important how her immunocompromised situation was and uh, she was having osteoporosis and osteoarthritis but she was not on any anti resorptive therapy she uh, had a chronic kidney disease but she was not on dialysis and also there is one important thing which we can here see that she was allergic to penicillin when we have such significant medical history it is very evident that they will be on a polypharmacy what is important to us here is what implication these medications can have on their oral condition and what that can have an impact on our dental intervention. So here more than five to six medication what she is taking has a side effect of dry mouth situation, which is really very important to us. And also we can see very significantly on her medical chart that she has been already ordered prior to the dental appointment, clindamycin. I already mentioned she's allergic to penicillin. According to the AHA guidelines, that's the next advised medication what has been given prior to the dental treatment. Now the researches are constantly evolving and the guidelines are constantly changing or the recommendations. So it's very important that we consider their medical conditions and their medical medications. But why it is important is to understand their physiological and the psychological factors. And also we need to consider these recommendations, collect all the possible information because we are legally accountable for care we are going to provide during our dental interventions. So when it comes to pre-medication, why do we need to pre-medicate? So the question is, is it because of her joint replacement or is it because of her immunocompromised situation or it is because of anything related to her cardiac? So it's not because of the double bypass 
bypass or the stent she was placed, but definitely because of the valve replacement she had in 2018, she had been ordered to take pre-medications before she go ahead with any of the invasive dental procedures. So coming to her dental history now, in 2013, she presented to the clinics where she was, uh, the initial examination was done and her tooth number five and 10 was extracted. Rest of the teeth was very well restored and she was been given with the removable partial denture. So now what happens next is she never came back after 2013 and I'm very sure now you know why, what would have happened in her life that the dental treatment could have taken a back seat with all what was happening with her medical condition. So 2017, she presented herself, but again, that was not for any of the dental procedure, but it was for getting a dental clearance to go in with her cardiac surgery, which she underwent in 2017. So this was mainly to get a clearance. If you look at the panoramic view there, it's, it's not very clear, I agree, but we see that most of the teeth were not in good shape. So maybe she got the clearance and she went, that was something that was needed during that visit. So later she was really very sad about her oral condition, what had deteriorated over the years, and she really wanted to get it fixed. Unfortunately, it was very late to save most of the teeth, but like how Dr. Kavin presented, it is about their chrono not just the chronological age, the biological age can have a greater impact on their oral health deterioration. And we need to consider based on their age and the longevity of the treatment, what we are going to provide. So based on this, because she wanted to save most of her teeth, which was a patient perspective. And as a dentist, what we thought is like when we are giving a complete denture, most of them, they get adapted to the maxillary dentures quite very well. But whenever it comes to the adapting to the mandibular dentures, it's quite challenging. So that was the main reason the plan was done that the upper teeth will be extracted and whatever possible in the best possible way, the lower teeth will be restored with GIC and most of the situation partial care is removal so that we can take the support of those teeth to logically designed some partial dentures on her. So it's very evident why she did not come to us after 2014, like whatever went in her life and what was the reason for her oral health deterioration, as I already mentioned. So when we know all these things about her, whether we can trust, whether we can provide the treatment is always the greatest challenge. So we need to be making certain treatment plan or we are accountable for the clinical decisions we make for such patient. What are the impact they're going to have on the dental treatment, what we are going to provide and how is the probability of success now with her dry mouth condition. So success is something like uh, it's, it can be defined. It varies according to the patient's comforts and according to what dentist would they think over a period of time. With her ability to maintain a good oral hygiene, I'm sure the success for a dentist would be to extract all the teeth and give her a denture so that we don't have to repair each time when, he comes, when she comes with some problem. But it is definitely our very significant thing is to provide them a very good care, the preventive, preventive care what we can provide. So, and functional limitation was taken care even though she did not have an insurance, she was funded by the uh, dental network so she could get that uh, the thing functional financially it was taken care of. So this is how she clinically presented after all the teeth was extracted and when the restoration of the teeth was carried out, most of the teeth, especially what we required, anterior was not in a very good shape that can provide a good stability for logically designing a cast partial denture. So that was very important that we restore tooth number 28, 20, as well as 18 and the anterior tooth 22 and 23, so that we can, longevity of the teeth can be, you know, taken care of so that we can provide her a cast partial denture. And the good oral prophylaxis was done to her and moisturizing the biotin gel was used so that she can keep the teeth moist. So why this clinical thing was done and why the material choices, we have already spoken about this in Dr. Kavin's presentation. The very important thing is a very good marginal seal, especially when we have done a partial caries removal that definitely takes a very important consideration. But as already mentioned, Superior release of fluoride is a very important thing when we are giving to a when we are giving GIC to a patient who has high risk for caries. So already the choice of material we have spoken with the recent advancement with that. So here is one of the study 
wherein they say that how the comparative thing was done with other materials and how superior it was with the Equia for GIC regarding the marginal seal. Now, there is very important consideration with going back to the science of dental materials. We already know that there is something called as tightly bound water, uh, water and loosely bound water when it comes to GIC. So GIC takes around six months to one year to completely get matured. So during this, like once the GIC GIC matrix, they need hydrated when they have to get that dimension when we are restoring it. But later on, this is what is called as a tightly bound water when it takes that water from the composition of GIC. But when there is a dry mouth situation or xerostomia, there is always that they don't get enough of hydration when the maturation phase is going on. So this is the time when the material can get desiccated due to the loss of water, which is called as loosely bound water. So this is very important. We tell the patient to sip the water very continuously, or they can always use something like a coat or even there are some a uh, lot of various salivary substitutes are available, which uh, this is one of the recent study where the wettability was measured and it was very much close. The contact angle was very much close to that of water, especially with the wet mouth and biotin gel, what we can see here. So all these are the choice of material which we have done so that we can well take care of her remaining teeth. So the complete denture was fabricated for her upper edentulous mouth, which was although low, well found, we could definitely give her some salivary substitute and hold them in place. And also for the bottom, we were able to restore most of the teeth that can logically help us to devise, design a cast partial denture and rehabilitate her in a best possible way. And uh, when we gave her the processes, I told you we started in February 2019. And when we completed with the treatment, it was somewhere just before the lockdown. She could not come to us after that. And after three months when she presented herself, before like how her profile looked before the rehabilitation there was significantly difference in that and now I can say like when I told the success can be defined when we give that comfort and when we can provide something better to them I think it's quite evident in her facial expression that she was well taking care of her oral cavity and also was happy with the treatment that was given. Definitely, it is important that she maintain a regular dentist appointment and take care of healthy diet and prescription toothpaste need to be given and also some oral health education whenever she visits for whatever care we decided to take to give her the best possible treatment. Thank you. So much Dr. Kapoor and also Dr. Cohen. Um, I think we have maybe time for one question, one or two questions. If anyone have any questions? We had a couple of questions in the chat. Yes, um, and I saw that um, so Dr. Hicks had a question. Yeah, about so I can approach those. I think there's three questions. A lot of them had to do with SDF and the possibility yeah. of using SDF uh, in lieu of maybe, I, I don't want to say in lieu of. Uh, SDF is great. We do use SDF in our practice sometimes, and we, we are very excited about it. But in the end, I've become less excited about SDF uh, because in the deciduous dentition, the way it is meant to be used is direct access to the cavitated lesion. So in a deciduous dentition, you've got small teeth. Most of the time, the caries is directly there. You get the SDF, you put it right on the lesion. Protocol then says to uh, leave it in a dried state uh, for three minutes, keep it dry. And then you can add fluoride varnish on the top of that if you would like to. So that's, and then you have to do it every six months for up to two years if you're going to get basically complete arresting of the of the uh, cavity of the cavity of the cavity of the carious lesion. So with our population, you know, we're looking at maybe interproximal caries. I showed you some interproximal caries that were down along the DEJ, and unless you can get that SDF directly on the lesion and leave it there for three minutes, then it becomes difficult. So the approach that we do take, if we're gonna use SDF, is to get super floss, put the super floss down through the tooth, add the SDF, so to make sure the super floss is in contact with that cavitated area, leave it there for three minutes, take the super floss out after it's been, in and, after, and then after that, apply fluoride varnish. Again, it's a little bit more an extensive procedure. It can still be done, but again, we're, if, especially if the lesion then goes subgingival, then it becomes even more difficult. So we're not getting great success with that. And I'm not saying that we can't do both. Uh, and sometimes we do do both. But again, it's, it's a trade-off sometimes. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Go. And um, since it's top of the hour, um, I would like to um, end this session. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, please complete the post-session survey. Um, I believe Dr. Aguilar posted the link um, in the chat. Um, thank you so much, everybody, um, especially to Dr. Cohen and Dr. Kunapur. Thank you. Um, I we hope to see you at our next session, um, which will be in September. Thank you so much. Thank you.